If people are coming along and joining us each day, um, what you'll find is I'm actually in the audiences, in the crowds, and I'm there with you trying to handpick some people who are heavily involved in their community and are doing their part in bringing each other together and lifting each other and supporting each other. Everyone has a story. So that's what I'm here on this trip and what I'm about. So the key focus is to instill confidence in one another and with each other and our story. Each time I flip through a slide here, by the way, I'm going to let you read. I'm going to talk as it comes to me. So yeah, feel free just to read ahead. Now the experience as a whole, when I engage with my subjects and my clients, it's about connection, engagement and emotion. I'm very, very blessed that where this has led me right now in my tracks as a photographer, that portraits, landscapes and people have come together and it's an intertwined creative business. It's beautiful it's an engagement story it's about sharing stories with one another and why we're here the storytelling process is very much based on emotional and connection documenting history and generations the artwork pieces we get in the end and sharing your story and what we can do with that which you'll find are to follow next with jade and linda in the marketing processes and events and engagement in community This is just a little bit of my work as I flow through and where I go. So why I've been invited here is each community is facing and dealing with hardships and challenges. Every, everyone has stuff going on. What is important about you and your story? So what, what makes you recognisable, what brings us together as a community and why is your story important? Well, as soon as we get together and we engage as people and you truly listen and you truly hear and you sit down and you have a cup of tea with someone and you have a wine with someone, that's when you get engagement and that's when storytelling comes to light. That's when you can capture the real person and that's what I've been fortunate enough to be Really, it's, it's an honour. I'm so grateful to have that. People can be transformed when they share their vulnerable side and that's what I'm starting to see in my business as it unfolds. The kind of people that I'm working with, um, it's, I, I started out photographing portraits, people, families, babies. A lot of people, especially in Mildura, would have seen that. Where it's taking me now is I'm finding myself out in the bush communities. We're on the border of New South Wales, South Australia and Victoria, as we know, here in Mildura. And that, that to me is just tracks out to anywhere. We can find where there's different land, there's different um, beauty in the landscapes and stories that are out there. And we're all facing different hardships and that, is, that definitely comes to light when I go out and stay on properties, which is a big part of what I do. I travel out onto people's stations and they share their life with me. They ask me to document their, their families, their connection, their deep connection, why they're out there doing what they do. And that is a bit of a documentation of their life that they can cherish forever because some people are facing times they don't know if they're going to have that forever. And that's so special to hold. Now, this family is uh, northwest New South Wales, about an hour and a half out of Whitecliffs. Now, this family have wanted me to go up to their property for two and a half years, but they've been facing, you know, hard times with the drought, which has been very unfortunate and like everyone's going through something. To have me out there, when Laura received these photos, she was overwhelmed with tears and joy. The fact that I was able to capture these for her was just incredible. So I'm going to let you read those two quotes there. 
what I have found is the most important part of my work is before the camera comes up, I make connection. I connect with you as a person, your family, what your message is about, what you're trying to get out to the world, what you're doing, what you do for a reason. And that definitely comes through in the photographs. When, you're, when you share your stories, I hear you, I see you, so does everybody else. Perspective has been a huge part of this job for me because when someone invites me into their home space and especially, so we're going through this crazy time with drought and dryness and if I travel out onto a property and they've, let's just say for instance, I've just come back from a bush trip and they've just had rain over Easter and it's beautiful and green at the moment, but for four years it's been dry, harsh conditions, people out there, they've had no joy, <laughs> it's been hard to find joy for a while now. Now me capturing the beautiful green gorgeous light, happiness, joy, and that's what they, ha that's what they have. They have that in within their families, it's beautiful. But it's been tough. So for us to put an image like that up on social media and say, here we go guys, it, this is a gorgeous family and I put no context with it, and it's just a photo of a beautiful green property, you know, you can assume it's just beautiful, life's been great, but with a bit of a story to attach to it, that just changes everything. It changes the dimension, it changes the way we look at it. If people just have a few words, even a caption to go along with it, actually, Dean, coming back to you, I've actually just jumped on your Onion Lake Project Facebook page. And the stories you share are brilliant, or, or whoever is doing that page. Having people behind those stories and really opening up and sharing them is is power. There is so much power in vulnerability and people being honest and open. And I think that's a big part of what I'm doing here is I'm sitting down at these tables, I'm connecting with people, I'm learning about what they've been through, and then they're really respecting what I'm doing for them in return. <clears throat> Back to the storytelling and about not being a farmer. <laughs> I'm clearly not a farmer. However, I'm saying that because I find myself on farms and on stations constantly. I'm drawn to the river line as well. People out there are changing my life and their stories are definitely impacting mine and I feel there's a definite need to share them. Um, I can offer you a new lens for a short amount of time and that's what's so powerful here is I walk in and I do I know times are tough but it's just been so nice to walk in and although I'm out there and it it's very dry and I'm capturing something that's looking harsh and nasty to them I see beauty the sun comes up and yeah I, I I'm always in awe and with creativity you can have a you can change the the viewfinder you can have a sense of scale, put some analogies out there. It's just, it's so powerful. I'll never forget these shots with this family here. It was a beautiful morning and I was <laughs> standing there in awe and Luke Finch, the father, he said, Tegan, you're always out daydreaming in the sky and <laughs> what's going on there? And he said, we don't want clear skies, we want clouds. We want lots and lots of clouds. <laughs> um, but when he got these pictures in return, he was so grateful and he thanked me immensely for capturing that because that's what he sees every day and that was so special to have. And this is another good one on perspective, just to show what an image can look like without any context and any text. So here we have a lake which is not even half full. However, this ran dry in 2017. Now, if I was just to photograph that and share it online and say, oh, what an awesome image this is. Check it out, look at the sunset, look at the water reflection, the silhouette. Without context, people can't have emotion and they can't relate to that. So that ran dry, it only just filled up this year. 
and that to them, to have this image now, we, they were so excited to take me to this lake and said, Tegan, you're just, you're just gonna love it down there. So back to connection. Without connection, you, you can't get much as a photographer. And I have realized that it's, I, technical skills are all well and great, but if I can't sit at the table and be a human, as any business owner will learn, that you need to have a lot of social skills. So being able to connect with these people has totally changed the way my work operates. Being engaged, constantly stepping into the shoes of these families and again it comes down to listening what they love and hearing where they like going and what they what they're proud of this bringing it all back to why we're here is making people feel proud of who they are and what they're doing and that it is beautiful and that bringing up a family in the bush is special so emotion has been one that's been emotion itself is something that I've found a lot of men that I photograph especially not targeting just men women are the, can be just as hard there's a we have a big strong guard up so unless you connect with someone you're not going to get that a beautiful emotion in the end so again if anyone wants to really invite themselves to listen and truly hear and listen to someone's story you're going to get very authentic responses and reactions and engagement if you just let that guard down and let them feel open and aware and it's I've certainly learned it's a superpower we shouldn't be afraid of it so what happens next you have all this beautiful content and you've got someone like me who travels out onto properties and we have a, a gorgeous story. Now, without the stories going anywhere, no one knows about it. So from here, we, what we open up from having these stories captured is community engagement resulting in togetherness. Now, this can be on social media, your papers, anything similar. Marketing and advertising opportunities, online presence, obviously, and the list goes on. You just cr you're creating stories for everyone to witness. Um, and coming back to regenerative communities road trip, which we're doing on this trip, if anyone has any person in their community that they feel is really doing their part and you know keeping you sticking together like glue, I would really love to know about them because th that's what we're about on this project. And you'll see me over the next few days if you're coming coming along. And just to end, people will forget what you said and what you did, but they will never forget how you made them feel. And that is truly coming back to the, the meaning crisis we have, because if you can allow people to feel comfortable, you're going you're gonna to win. All of our experiences and layers make us who we are. Show them. If you want to engage, pause, listen, be patient and be present. <clears throat> Just never underestimate the power of sharing your story. That's what I'd like to end with. Beautiful. Wow, so beautiful. Big hand for taking amazing work. Thank you. Wow. Hands up if you've got someone in the uh, community you'd love to connect Tegan with who's passionate and good. Come on. Well, Tegan's going to be here. You, at lunchtime, go to Tegan and, and they'll she'll be happy to photograph them. You can photograph my mother. She's 93, dances disco, drinks her whiskey and parties hard. <laughs> That's where I get my energy from. Big hand for Tegan and well done. Now, let's... I got to spend a little bit of last night walking the streets at night, which is a beautiful experience in Mildura with the lovely Linda. And we had a good connection. We got to know each other. And I think what Linda's doing is um, extraordinary work around really, again, about storytelling and tourism, yeah? 
How do we unleash and unlock that capacity? Not only to get the locals to love the place, but to get everyone else to love your place. So big hand for Linda, who's doing amazing work around regional and rural Australia in tourism. Cheers, thank you. Thank you, Gil. Uh, I'm just gonna put my, oh, I'm just gonna put my timer on here. Oh my God, Tegan, I almost cried listening to you. Um, how beautiful. And it's such a perfect introduction for me because what Tegan just spoke about is the epitome of what I'm going to share with you today. Tegan's experience going on to these properties and, and meeting these farmers and these local characters can be extended well beyond just one individual. And that's the opportunity that tourism presents to regional and rural communities. It's about connecting the people and the place and inviting our visitors in to experience that. So thank you for the intro, Tegan. Um, so just quickly, um, a little bit about myself. I'm from Toowoomba um, in southern Queensland. I've been there for about four to five years now and prior to that I was in Wagga. Um, so a little bit more local um, for about 12 years. Um, so. I certainly know what it's like to be in drought. We've got towns um, surrounding us at the moment that have no water. So it's pretty tough and we're all struggling, um, but we're very resilient as well in rural communities. So we just get on with the job. Uh, I work in tourism, so I've been in business now for 12 years and I'm fortunate enough to travel around all parts of Australia to engage with and assist and support regional and rural communities in realising their full potential with tourism. And it's a really interesting journey because, you know, when I think about it 12 years ago, when I would go into a rural community and say the word tourism, most of the councillors and community and farmers would just look at me and go, here we go. Um, it was always seen as this real fluffy industry. It could never stand up against agricultural mining or you know, those more typical industries within regional and rural communities. But I tell you what, there has been a massive shift, a massive shift in the last three to five years. Um, I get regular phone calls from regional and rural councils with a very similar request which often goes something along the lines of, we need help to attract more visitors into our community to help grow the economy. How do we do that? We have a lot of regional and rural communities and councils that aren't familiar with tourism. They don't really understand what they can do or what they actually have that creates an opportunity to attract visitors into their town, their community or their destination. So I'm lucky enough to be able to work with a lot of these communities to allow them to actually realise their potential and to see what they have. Um, so my absolute passion, my purpose is insist assisting these communities to realise their absolute potential in tourism, not just in growing the economy, but in connecting communities. And what we've been talking about this morning around storytelling, around people, around place is so relevant to tourism because tourism is all about storytelling. We need to be able to connect the people and place and tell our story to invite and welcome visitors into our communities. So why are we talking about tourism? Why is it so important? Like I said, there's been a massive shift in the last four to five years within regional and rural communities. A lot of them are now starting to realise the opportunity that tourism presents. And some of these figures suggest why. Tourism is a massive industry and regional tourism in particular is growing rapidly. So a lot of these figures have come out just in August this year from Tourism Australia. So we're seeing massive increase in regional opportunities from a tourism um, and events point of view. Figures are growing, numbers are going up, we're seeing an increase in drive tourism and the most significant experience in regional communities is food and wine closely followed by nature and indigenous experiences. So these figures suggest to us there's an opportunity, right? It's, it's growing, there's more and more interest um, in regional tourism. But why? Why do visitors want to come into regional and rural communities? And often we ask ourselves that, why would people want to come to Mildura? Why would people come to Toowoomba? 
Why would they go to Tennant Creek? What is our story? We need to understand the why. Some of these reasons um, on, the, on the screen right now are things that have been discussed over the last couple of years. So people are wanting to disconnect and they want to reconnect. So they want, they want that reason to come together. They want to get away from it all. Life's just too busy. We're overwhelmed. We're running all the time. They want to get away from, away from it all and they want to enjoy the simple things. They want to live like a local. And when Tegan was showing that, those photos just before and saying how she has the opportunity to go onto these properties and, and sit down and have a cup of tea, that's a tourism experience. People would pay money to experience that. They want to understand why, why do you live a million kilometres from nowhere and how do you live like that? There's a real curiosity in us these days. They want to feel like they're giving back. There's also this sense of how can we help? You know, people coming out of metropolitan areas in particular, they want to feel like they can give back and help and feel connected to the bush. Um, and they are looking for experiences, as I said, food and wine, nature and indigenous are key experiences that they're looking for when they come into regional and rural communities. So that's what our visitors are looking for. There's just a couple of quick examples of visitors that are looking for real, untouched, raw experiences. So often we think about this need to actually create something. We need to have a dream world or we need to have a Shearer's Hall of Fame or we need a massive big building. I think it was Dean that touched on before, you know, this thing of we build these big assets or attractions thinking that build it and they will come, but we often forget that it's the grassroots or it's the people or it's the actual essence of the place that often attracts people, or it's our natural surrounding. So these are the Pink Lakes in WA, um, and they have absolutely gone crazy with Chinese visitors. So they were locked up, people found their way in, got some selfies, and now it is in massive demand. Something that the council would never have envisaged. Similar down the road from me in Southern Queensland, sunflowers. I still can't believe that a farmer hasn't taken this opportunity and turned it into a tourism experience. And interesting story, one farmer has actually thought it was a really would be great to put, you know, quite powerful electric fencing around and not put signage on it and get a bit of a laugh out of the tourists hitting the electric fencing. Not really what we want to do, but my point with that is there's these opportunities right at our doorstep that we, we, when we live in these areas, we don't realise the potential. The sunflowers in Allera in southern Queensland, it's causing traffic jams. Council have actually had to look at traffic management because people are just stopping all along the highways, tramping through paddocks and getting that ideal selfie with a sunflower. These are the experiences that visitors are looking for. They don't want to walk around museums and, you know, look at displays and, you know, they want immersive, authentic, raw experiences. This is an example of a council that's actually been able to activate this. So they've actually gone, okay, people love this yellow fields of canola. In the Riverina um, area in New South Wales, so around Juni, Coolerman, so just near Wagga, they've identified this as an opportunity to build rural tourism. So they created the canola trail they're capitalising on the yellow paddocks and that opportunity to have really visual high impact content. And now what's happening is you're getting people travelling through these smaller rural communities to actually go and experience the canola fields. At the same time they're spending money at petrol stations, cafes, roadhouses, art and craft stores and creating a real economic boom for that um, community. So it's the things that we don't often think of that create the biggest tourism opportunity for us. So the opportunities and challenges for rural communities, there's so many great exciting opportunities. As I said, tourism is a key emerging industry. Our regions have great history, we have great people 
We have great landscapes, wildlife. There's so much surrounding us in any regional community that we just don't realise. Um, even if you feel like you don't have an iconic attraction, so often people will say to me, but we don't have an iconic attraction. How do we promote ourselves as a destination? Often it's just the essence of the place. It's the rural community. It's the people that create the attraction. Uh, and we have a massive boom at the moment with grey nomads. So that presents a big opportunity. They're on the road. The number of caravan sales and RV sales are just absolutely ridiculous at the moment. So there's this real opportunity to capitalise on that market. Now look, challenges in the same, um, in the same breath, the grey nomads, that's also a challenge. How do we diversify ourselves away from that market? Other challenges, many businesses don't see themselves in tourism. This is a big issue in regional and rural communities because everybody plays a role in tourism. So if we have some local businesses that don't feel that they are part of tourism, then they don't deliver the experience and that can have a negative impact on our visitors. So how do we actually get them to be feeling that they are part of the tourism industry or the tourism funnel? We don't often have a lot of activities for visitors. Infrastructure and facilities are sometimes lacking. It can be hard to attract investment. Difficult to compete on cost. I mean, you only got to look at regional flights. It's crazy. So that is a real challenge for us. Um, and we need to make sure that things happen in parallel. And often we don't have the resourcing to actually achieve that. So that can be a challenge um, as well. So with all that said, how can rural communities embrace these opportunities and realise their full potential in tourism? The first thing we need to ask ourselves is, are we a destination? Are we a destination? If so, what types of visitors would come to our destination? Two key questions you need to ask yourself and then you need to start looking at, well, what do we have to offer? And that's a real key process in understanding and realising your full potential. As I've said, we don't need a massive, you know, anchor tourism experience. But we do need to understand what our story is. What do we have to offer visitors? Um, I'm just going to run through this quickly. So what I wanted to quickly share with you is when I go in and work with rural communities, you know, it's really important to break down that uh, mindset that we need to build something. So I often go in and I say to them, we need to look at what I call the four pillars of the tourism industry. We need to understand that in order for us to develop a sustainable tourism industry within a destination, we need to consider all of these elements. Those elements are industry and community development. What does, what's the role of industry and community within tourism? We need to look at visitor servicing, we need to look at product and experience development, and then of course the sexy one is marketing. There's no point investing heavily in marketing if we don't have the experiences to offer our visitors. And also, there's no point investing in marketing and spending a lot of money to draw visitors into our destination if we can't deliver on the ground. I don't know if anybody's been out to Thargaminda, but you may know the Royal Hotel in Thargaminda. There's actually a lady that owns that hotel that has a name called Surly Shirley. The tourists have called her that, and it's actually gone viral on social media. But she, fortunately enough, the tourists have actually turned it into a bit of a joke, but She's a risk to the tourism industry in Thargaminda because her customer service is atrocious. Like I've never experienced anything so bad. But that's a really important piece of the puzzle because if we're investing in tourism and we're looking at growing and developing, our whole community needs to be part of that. They need to be part of a shared story. And we need to know what that shared story is and we need to be able to deliver the experience to our visitors. So everyone plays a role in providing a tourism experience. And somebody made a comment up here before about council, you know, saying council should be doing that for us. That is a, the wrong attitude. This is a holistic approach to developing tourism. There's a role for everybody in making sure that we can create a sustainable tourism um, economy. So we need council staff, local business, community groups, community members, inclu including youth. So it's everybody within that community needs to be involved. And like I said, if we market and promote the destination successfully, 
but fail to deliver when visitors arrive will never ever realise that full potential and we can actually get the reverse happening to us. The other thing we need to consider in developing a tourism industry is product and experience development. It's been said a couple of times now, but we do not need to develop the next dream world. We do not need to develop the Long Reach Hall of Fame. What we do need to do is actually have a really good close look as a community at what we actually have. What exists, what is already there that we can work with. And that's an important process for communities to go through. And if you start to talk about that within your community, you'll soon start to identify what your story is. What's unique about your place? Destination brand and marketing. So as I said, this is often the sexy one. A lot of people will first, first thing they go to is we need to market our destination. Well, yes, you do. You need to tell your story, but you need to first of all get your story right. And everybody needs to be working together and, and in cooperation in delivering on that particular story. Brand and marketing, it's the easy part. And finally, visitor services. So when we talk about visitor services, people often think of the typical uh, visitor information centre that you'll find here in Mildura. And absolutely that's a part of visitor servicing, but when we look at visitor servicing, we need to look at the whole community, the whole destination. Petrol stations, supermarkets. I recently did some work with Tourism Central Australia and we looked at the whole visitor servicing for Central Australia. And that was a really interesting process because what we had to do is we had to go, okay, well, people aren't necessarily going out of their way to go to visitor information centres anymore, but we want to actually be able to engage with them and connect with them as they're travelling past or through our destinations because there's an opportunity to connect and tell our story. And if we can do that, we have an opportunity to encourage them to stay an extra night. And that's the challenge that I set for all of my clients. It doesn't matter if you're in you know, middle of central Australia or in Sydney. In visitor servicing, your job is to do what you can to encourage visitors to stay at least one more night. So we need to think about how are our visitors travelling through our region. They may not be coming to the visitor centre in Mildura. They might be passing through and going past a, a roadhouse or you know, a main intersection. This photo, which you can't see really well, but this is a little coffee shop near Emerald in central Queensland. He's actually created a business out of this at a um, crossroads, major crossroads near the gem fields um, just west of um, Emerald in central Queensland as you're heading to Longreach. So a lot of traffic by grey nomads in the winter and it's also a major um, traffic um, area for local residents as well. He's now created a business out of this. So that to me is a key visitor servicing touch point. He's a critical person in terms of encouraging visitors to, to stay within the region. So we need to know how to connect with our visitors in whatever way it is that they're traveling through our region because we all have a job to encourage them to stay extra. So what is your shared story? I want you to think about it. In, is your community, is it a destination? What is your story? You know, Gil talked about it at the start, about what will spark your community? And that's the thing we need to identify in tourism. We're trying to identify what gets the community excited. And someone else touched on the idea of, we don't always have to think about creating something for the tourists. If we actually create something that gets our community excited, that we love, that gives us a reason to live here, visitors will love it as well. So what is that story? What's special about your place? What's special about your people? Once you know that, you can identify the gaps in terms of development and the work that needs to be done and the projects that you need to explore to be able to capitalise on the tourism opportunity. And a key message there is please don't try to be something you're not. And, and there's a big risk of that in regional communities because of lack of understanding and knowledge. We don't want to all have a dinosaur museum like Winton. 
I think that's what every single Western Queensland council has said to me in the last two years, is we want to be like Winton. <laughs> Winton didn't just become popular overnight. There was a lot of time and energy and, and a lot of luck from a farmer that tripped over a dinosaur bone um, that resulted in the success of Winton. It's good to be inspired and get the ideas, but we need to think about our own story, what's special about our place. And sometimes it's something little that can spark that excitement and creativity. So just some practical tips for you to take away. You need to audit your region. And when that doesn't need to be a big, scary process. You can do it as a community. You know, get everybody involved. It's about sitting down and brainstorming. What do we have? What is special about our place? Things do need to happen in parallel. So all of those pillars that I just talked to you about, you can't do the marketing unless you've got the experiences to sell. And you don't want to push and sell the experiences unless your people are all on board to be able to deliver the experience. You need to have some local drivers and champions. There'll always be the naysayers. We've done that before. I don't want to do that. Um, we have those in all communities. We don't waste our energy on the naysayers. Find the leaders, find the champions and push forward because you know what happens? The others will follow, most of them. You need to create a positive business culture. Um, so encourage everybody to understand and appreciate the value of tourism. And we talk a lot about this in rural communities. If we don't understand the value or the why, why are we doing this? Why is tourism important? What's the impact it's having? Then the businesses won't come on board. So celebrate the successes. Make sure you collaborate because we all need to come together. We all have our own individual stories, but this is about creating that shared story, coming together to collaborate, to sell and celebrate our destination. And it is continual effort. So it's not something that you can turn on and off. Um, tourism is something that needs constant attention and effort and reinvigoration. And most importantly, always be consumer led and focused. It's really important that we focus on our consumers. And, and this is a, a message that I want everybody to take away. We can sit around a room and we can talk about all of the great ideas and inspiration, but if it's not something that interests our visitors, then we're wasting a lot of time. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Linda, for the inspiration. Great pearls of wisdom. Let's get our stories happening. Yay. So we'll get some questions happening very soon, that, that panel. But um, now I've got the pleasure to invite Jay, Jade Miles, to the, to the stage. Jay's a business builder at Black Barn Farm and Consult. But one of the things I got inspired in um, your little vibe, vibe here was about capturing people's imagination and taking them on the journey. So let's hear about that journey, um, Jade, and, and that whole system thinking. So. Am I on? You on? I'm on. Big head. Hello, everybody. <laughs> I walk, so I'm not going to stand behind that because I move a whole lot and I'll Good. knock something over. I want to start with a question. I always start with this question because it really gets you pondering, especially in rural communities. When was the last time you had an apple and thought about the name of the person who grew it? <laughs> True. Actually, when was the last time you thought about the food at all that was sitting on your plate? Yeah, and hopefully in this kind of room there's a few nodding their head and that's really good to see. Sadly though, food has become, it's become a commodity, it's become a means to an end and it's not something that we celebrate. And for us in rural Australia that has a real impact. Where I'm from in Stanley in northeast Victoria in the rolling green hills, this is a very real thing. I live on a plateau where there used to be 35 apple growing families. There are now just two. We're one of them, and we are the very first people to put an orchard in, in 40 years. The other guy, he's a fifth generation apple farmer, and he came to us a year ago, and I'll talk to you a little bit about what he said to me a year ago at the very end of my presentation. But in essence, he's got the bulldozer there, it's ready to go, but instead of pushing the trees out, he's asked us to lease it. Where's my dongle? 
So Black Barn Farm, as I said, is in northeast Victoria. We've got 20 acres, it's tiny. We're surrounded by other small plots. We uh, are in a really vibrant tourism region. We have really good rainfall and it's particularly aesthetically beautiful. We chose it quite intentionally after a 10 year hunt. That 10 year hunt took us on a real journey all over the country looking at different sorts of farms, different sorts of models to understand why we wanted to farm and how we wanted to farm. And this kind of talks to Linda's point. What is our why? Every one of our family and friends spent the 10 years while we researched trying to talk us out of farming altogether. So why did we keep going? Here's the thing, everyone here and everyone you'll ever meet eats. We eat a whole lot. My 12 year old twins eat more than I care to know. What we eat has the massive potential to make a difference. A difference to our farmers, which are kind of in rural communities which are decaying because they don't have succession plans. Sam will talk about that later today. A difference to our kids who don't know where their food comes from and sure as hell don't know how to celebrate it. A difference to us because we just want to connect and it's something that we can connect through. A difference to us and our knowledge of where we got our food from and our food sovereignty, not with long supply chains but with short supply chains. It has the profound ability to make a massive difference and it's just because we eat and every one of us does it. Australia's farming communities, and you know I'm looking at a, a full room of people who don't look like you're decaying, but Australian farming communities are decaying. We have lower seed soil biodiversity than we've ever seen before. We have high levels of suicide. We have high levels of disconnection, longer supply chains, shorter profits to farmers, not so much food security. We have a whole lot of reasons to be feeling pretty distressed about the state of our food system. I'm not going to talk too much about that because that's for Deb later on this afternoon. But this is part of our why. I want you to know that my story, which is what Linda just referred to, is really deeply entrenched in our why. We know that biodiversity equals resiliency and a regenerative community is about diversity. Yet in the last hundred years we've gone from 100% choice in, in seed bank varieties down to just 10%. So 10% of what was available to us hundred years ago is now all we have. We also know that 50% of all of the food that the Western world produced last year went to waste. And that was right across the massive supply chain that we're looking at. Yet 50%, if you ask the CEO of Food Bank Australia, 50% of Australians at some point went without a meal. We kind of got it a bit wrong. We know that 48% of all of our farmers, when they were last uh, surveyed about three years ago, declared that um, the mental burden of the farm bank debt was overwhelming. We know that by 2050 there will be about 9.5 billion people living in the world and we know that 80% of those on the current trajectory will be living in an urban environment. We also know that there's a very strong correlation that when you live in an urban environment you're categorically disconnected from the food on your plate. If you don't connect with something it means you don't understand it and if you don't understand it you don't trust it therefore you don't love it you're sure as hell not going to fight for it and value it. Hence the waste that we are looking at earlier. <laughs> you also know, and this is kind of disturbing, that despite the fact that food is one of the most fundamental things that every one of us does, even if we don't know the name of our, our farmers, we still continue to eat three times a day. But just about everything you find in a supermarket comes back to these ten multinationals. They are not taking into consideration the mental wellbeing of our, our regional communities. They are not considering the education needs of our regional communities and of all of the people who eat food. It is kind of critical yet it is not quite happening. So what? What are we going to do about it? This is the fun bit. My husband and I packed our kids up, we went to the States and we researched what a really vibrant local food system looks like. And we came back to our little tiny town of just 2,500 people and we said what are we going to do about it? What do we want a local food system to look like so that we can build something that is vibrant, so that our community is alive and so that we can be really proud to be farmers. We want to farm. At this point we weren't yet farming. So we started a food co-op. We started it in the main street 
It was a community effort. We had 60 initial members with 60 products on the shelves. Within a year and a half, we had 800 members with 500 products on the shelves, and we were working with 35 different farmers to get their product directly to their consumer. We were connecting our eaters and our growers. We were also committing to advocacy. We did a huge amount of work. We kind of looked at everything that was going on at the grassroots level and we supported Grow the Grower networks and school camp programs. We also looked at advocacy and we started to work on local food action plans. And we delivered about 15 events every year. But the long and the short is that what we ended up building was a really strong, engaged community who actually celebrated the local growers and started to understand the value of a local food system. And so on that, we started to build. Can you flick me through from that? I did have a sense when I popped some videos into this presentation that there was potential for it to go wrong. Yeah. Yeah. I'll flick the last three. I'll ignore the last three slides. Video. Yeah, I'll, I'll get rid of your slides. No, okay. So essentially what it looked like was a little bit like this. We had Grow the Growers initiatives, we had school camps, we had a North East Fair food group, we had um, lots and lots of events going on. We had a North East local food action plan and a North East local food network. We had some really strong agritourism initiatives on the ground. We had an incredibly, and have, an incredibly engaged community of growers, eaters, connectors, creatives. You know, I, I'm kind of getting to the point where I'm saying that what Linda was saying is exactly what you need and what Tegan was saying is exactly what you need. It can't just be one person as part of that supply chain that needs to be part of a really engaged um, community organisation. Am I right to go with the video, do we think? Yeah, give, it give it a crack. Yeah. Is it going to buffer the whole time? Yeah. <laughs> if we come together over food that's been ethically... You can might flick it. I think we might flick it, but everybody will be sent the full presentation, which means you'll also have the embedded videos in it, which means you can access it and, and see them. So all of this felt amazing, but we still hadn't quite nailed our why. Our story and our reason for being still felt like we'd been playing with the big boys and we didn't have our hands in the dirt. At this point, we'd bought land. We'd spent 10 years researching exactly what we wanted and what our model needed to look like. And we bought this land in Stanley. And it's exactly that. It's a vibrant, dynamic, and highly engaged, yet really simple, seasonally oriented farm. We impact and work with about 3,000 people a year. We have an open farm, um, a pick your own, that is open from the start of uh, Feb right through to the end of May. We run school camps through the place. We run a whole series of workshops. Our kids are really heavily involved, and so too are the broader community. That's an a, a video, so I'll flick through that. The Pick Your Own is at the orchard that is leased to us by the guy who was the other guy that still has an orchard in place that didn't get bulldozed. And he came to us because he knew we weren't going to put food on the back of a truck and send it away without any sense of connection. He came to us because he knew that we would have the ability to offer a Pick Your Own, which was a totally different business model. And we, we, we had a whole lot of trial and error, but we, but we got there and we had an incredible year and we dealt with about 3,500 visitors who came to visit us for the first time. Our boys, who are 12-year-old twins, you can see in the middle photo up there, they started a business called Dobros where they made apple cider donuts and they developed a bit of a cult following and we all got fat. It was great. <laughs> We worked with a whole stack of local farmers who had pigs or who had chooks or who had geese and they wanted windfall apples. We worked with the food cooperative who wanted to run a, a great big community apple cider vinegar making day and we gave them windfall apples. We worked with local florists who wanted to pick the flowers that came out of our uh, rows of, of flowers that were put up the middle of the orchard rows. And we worked with school groups to encourage them to bring kids out to pick an apple from a tree and understand what that, that, what that looked like and what that meant and to learn what our name was. 
that's also a video. We developed a thing called Greener Grass Collective and we've had about 26 schools go through the program in the last two years and uh, it's either a one to five day multi-farm, on-farm experience for kids to learn where their food comes from. We get chalk out and we draw on the back of beef cows. We make sourdough bread, we pick berries, we um, harvest apples, we make trail mix out of provenance identified organic food and talk about long supply chains and short supply chains at the food co-op. These kids go home with such an incredibly profound understanding of where their food comes from that it starts to, this is our why, this is our story and this is what we're here to, what, what, we, what we've put ourselves on the map to do. We run events and workshops and last year we ran about 22 of them and sometimes they're teeny tiny and it might be two people coming to learn how to make sourdough bread. Sometimes there might be 200 people that come to do an open farm tour because like Linda says, they want to know what life looks like on the land and why we've chosen to do it and how we go about it every day. Grafting, our fruit tree grafting workshop, without doubt, sells out every single year. I didn't realise so many people wanted to know how to graft an apple tree, but seemingly they do. Our workshops are quite um, vast and varied. For us, diversity is key. So not only are we farmers of fruit that has five different paths to market so that if any one of them falls over, we're okay. We're also nurserymen. So every time we grow trees for ourselves or graft trees for ourselves, we do another thousand of them we, and we sell them direct to our consumers the following year. We're also educators, so we open our doors, even though the place sometimes looks like an absolute upside down working farm and my OCD goes into drive, overdrive. I, I have people through all the time learning and experiencing different things, all different age groups, it's looking through totally different lenses and that's really critical for us. It's sharing our story. We have about 95 varieties of apple. There's about four and a half thousand that exist in Australia and we have 95 of them. We have about 17 varieties of cherry, nine varieties of pear and about two and a half kilometres of berries across about 30 different varieties. And what that does is give us a growing and picking season that extends beyond the normal six week window. So again, it's diverse. All of our trees are on different rootstock. All of our trees are planted into really rich, dynamic and complex varieties of underplantings which again adds diversity. We actively seek media attention and we shout it out loud and we do that on purpose. We do that because we feel it's our responsibility as farmers to take pride in what we do and not just provide a product that goes to an unknown shelf to an unknown eater, but connects us deeply to the people that are eating it. We don't want to send our food away. We want to know who's eating our food and we want them to know our name. So we shout our story out as loudly as we can to encourage other people to consider that as a model. And I talk about it all the time. And next time I won't include videos because <laughs> I can't tap dance that much. Again, I think it's really important. We've got to share our stories. It doesn't always work. Sometimes there's huge failures. In fact, I just said to Sam a minute ago, I said, how good's your Instagram account? And I said, yeah, but I didn't put anything there about the fact that I blew the diff on the tractor two days ago and I don't know how to fix it. And my husband's off farm working because he's got to bring the income in. I don't put that on Instagram because we are a tourism product as well as a, and I'm writing a, a book right now and I need people to kind of buy the book because they think it's joyful, not full of sorrow. You know, and farming is damn hard, and I've got to be truthful about that, but, you know, our story has got to be sh shared, and we've got to find different ways to tell it. So we do. If anyone invites us, we go. The impact of all of that, of a really vibrant local food system, and of a farm that is dynamic and diverse, are all of these things. What we've done is work really collaboratively with as many other community groups as we possibly can to deliver a vibrant food system that is inclusive, that is replicable, that is sustainable, and that connects our eaters to our growers because we all eat. And we need to start celebrating the fact that farmers are at the back of the meal that you're about to eat. On a really personal note, <laughs> what that looks like and the impact of that is a fifth generation, 75 year old farmer knocking on your door on a Tuesday, unable to speak. He could not get a word out because his throat was locked. He had just lost his contract with his wholesaler because the colour of his granny smiths were golden. We'd had a really hot summer. 
And he said, I'm done. I've got the bulldozer ready to go. What can I do? Within 24 hours, we'd convinced him to not bulldoze those trees, but to consider a pick your own, which he thought was a complete waste of time. But within four days, we got 800 people to his farm and they picked 2,000 kilos of apples. They did that in an hour and a half and they paid him a fair price. They paid him the price that he deserved for the hours that he'd put in to produce that food. They connected to each other, they picked an apple and learnt where their food came from and they sure as hell knew his name by the end of it. That is our why. That is our story. And I've got to tell you, as farmers, we can't just be friends with farmers. We need every one of us to come together. We need the people in tourism. Thank you, Linda. We need the people from Cultivate Farms who are connecting us with the next generation. We need the next generation to fall in love with farming because that is what is on the back. That's what we are built on the back of. We need to know the names of our farmers. We need our creatives to help us tell our stories and we sure as hell need to celebrate farming and the people who grow it. Thank you. Thank you. That was um, extraordinary, and um, I'm sure you've got questions. And um, can we get our three speakers to uh, come back on the stage, please, and um, give them a th amazing round of applause for the extraordinary in inspiration and insights. And um, Plenty of passion, huh? I think we talked about passion. It's going to drive everything in the world. Thank you for that, all three of you. So, um, and, and where passion comes, love. So here's a question. How can we capture and articulate an essence of place for our communities that people are inspired and believe in? Yep. How do we capture and articulate an essence, you know, that spirit of place, that spark, you know, for our communities that people are inspired and believe in? Who'd like to start? We'll go from yep. Tegan. I think we all need to come together and work out what our why is. Yeah. You'll okay, probably support right. that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And connect together and then big businesses or groups, organisations having that same why and then we get that message out. Great. Let's continue. Yeah. And Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Give us a yeah. Whoa, wow. <laughs> Thanks, Linda. <laughs> Maybe you don't need a mic. I'm that now. Um, no, go for it. Use the mic. So I, I think just to add to that, the my key message with that is you as a community need to believe that. So if you want to be able to sell the essence of your place and what is real and true about your place, then you as a community need to believe that. Mm. Don't try to be something you're not. Yeah, wonderful. Keep it authentic. Yeah, I mean, I agree with both of those wholeheartedly. And um, the other thing is, we are in a world that is very fast paced and we all feel like we need to have all of the answers immediately. These things don't happen quickly. So understanding what a community's needs are, they're deep and they're slow. And you don't always get it right the first time either. And I think it's about making sure that as the journey unfolds, there is enough openness for everybody to participate in that journey and to come along that ride. Because it'll mean that whatever the project is you're working on will ebb and flow, and it needs to ebb and flow. Projects that have value don't happen quickly and they don't happen from a strategic plan. They happen with a heartbeat, and I think it's really important that we continue to acknowledge that heartbeats evolve and that communities evolve and that we need to take our projects with those. Yeah. I love what you just said there about slow and deep. And there's a global movement, you know, chitta slow, slow food and slow communities, yeah, and slow cities, which is picking up pace 
excuse the pun, <laughs> which is a good thing. We all need to embrace, yeah, that coming back. So thank you. Jay, this is sort of your question, the next one. How can we apply this inspiration to broadacre dry land farming communities? Um, yeah, and I'm speaking, in, I'm speaking in Oyen tomorrow, and I'm very aware that my story is small plot. It's very different to uh, Oyen's community dynamic. So I'm sensitive to that, and I don't always have all the answers, I promise. But um, I would say that, again, it's about your why. It's about understanding what your story is and what differentiates you. So there's some beautiful examples of that. Dad's Oats is a really good one. They are a fifth generation, um, you know, mass production commodity grower, oat grower. Yet they've managed to find their story and tell it. They've told it richly and beautifully and really comprehensively so that eaters now celebrate them and understand them. And I think, you know, they're one good example. There's another one who does rain fed rain-fed rice. I don't know if anyone's familiar with rain-fed rice. They ran out of water. They lost their irrigation right and it nearly put them in the, in the bin. And instead they said, let's capitalise on that. Let's change our story and become rain-fed rice and let's see what happens. And four out of their six seasons often don't go to market. But when they do go to market, people wholly and solely back them. So I don't know, I need to do a bit more thinking about that, but I do think that by understanding what your story is and what your point of difference is, and a very genuine commitment to telling your story, and that's often something that inland, broad acre, dry land farming communities don't necessarily want to do. They want to focus on farming. And there's no doubt that there are some people who are suited to marketing and some people who are not. Um, but, <laughs> You know, if we're going to educate our eaters to become considered consumers, we need to participate in that journey as farmers. Good one. So how has social media changed rural marketing and how can rural communities better harness the power of this platform? We'll go down. You can start, Tegan. I think we can see the shift happening oh, rapidly. It, it's the raw, authentic stories people are connecting with. I myself and know many people who removed Facebook and Instagram off their phones completely um, in the last few months and last year, I did myself, came back and you start connecting with the real stories and people are really engaged in knowing your story and who you are and seeing a person behind that brand as well. So you can't always share you, 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 but the stories have power and we're very aware of that, I think. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And Look, in tourism and destination marketing, social media is a really powerful tool for us to share stories and promote destinations and events. So it's certainly um, a powerful platform to use. As a mother of two pre-teens, I wish it would go away. Um, but I don't think it is. So, you know, in terms of rural communities, it is a platform. But once again, you need to know what your story is and what your message is, because social media you know, it, it's certainly a powerful marketing tool, but you know, it, it can also have the opposite effect as well. So being really clear on if you're using social media as a rural marketing tool, what is our message? Um, what is our story? And how are we using social media to distribute that? Um, and I think what, what Tegan's doing with this portrait project with Grazier, I mean, that, that is a fantastic example. Um, we, as humans, are so curious and we want the personable stories. You know, if we can engage with the people in rural communities and then we can tell the story of the people within our communities through social media, it really allows people all over the world to connect with us. And I think that's a really exciting, powerful tool from a, a marketing perspective. I'm just going to add really quickly. So with my job and not, like I have said, not being a farmer, I've got incredible photographs. I've, I've got photographs every week of different properties and people and I could just bang those photos out every, every day and just say, oh wow, look at this sun, look how beautiful it is. But I don't do that because it's, one, it's not fair putting everyone's lives out there fully, but we can assume something and assume only the beauty. And if you don't have time to properly, properly share the stories, then it, social media can be used in the wrong ways. And that's very unfair for people who go through those hardships. So I'm, I'm very aware of that. Yep. Social media can, definitely has two sides. Good point. Wonderful. So there's a question about how important is it for the whole community to be on the same page, yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and have a consistent shared story, which all three of you have been talking about. Mm -hmm. But how do we encourage it? And I'm going to add, how do we get there? Like, 
seems to be the a sticking point for a lot of communities to have that yeah, yeah, yeah. get them in the same tent and shared story. Um, so when we first began, we started with one of those kitchen tea, kitchen table conversations. We sat around with 15 people and we rapidly realised that we didn't fit around my kitchen table so we moved into our shed because there were 25 people and then suddenly there were 45 people. We just started. We started with those who were the kernels of hope and had a clear idea and were happy to come together in a sense of collaboration for something that was going to be created that was bigger than any one of them. And it's a little bit like the, the Oyen um, Dam Lake. <laughs> I'm from smaller <laughs> countryside where things are in dam size, not lake size. Um, you, you know, you don't have to have everybody on the same page, but getting people in a really collaborative mindset where they all believe in something that is bigger than all of them to kind of push forward rapidly sends a message up to those who then have the ability to shift uh, their opinions and their policies and their funding streams if that's what you needed. Although we didn't with our food co-op, we didn't have any funding support from anybody at all and still haven't. It's all run on volunteer time. Um, I think you've just got to start having the conversations and you've got to do it as a leader and you've got to be willing to, to bear the brunt of that because sometimes being the leader of that means you've got to have pretty broad shoulders. But you've also got to be willing to listen and really listen to what it is that the community wants because there is no such thing as a one-size-fits-all solution. Place-based solutions are critical. Mm. Any, anything and to add yeah, to I'll that? just quickly add to that as well. Um, people need to know how they fit the story. You know, I think it's really important, you know, you do need a shared story and I come at this from a tourism perspective and we're selling a destination, we're selling, you know, the, the community, the whole experience. Um, but I think it's really important for people to also know how they fit within that story. Good point. There's a question up there, I think, to you, Jay. Did that neighbouring apple farmer survive and stay long term? He was so overwhelmed by the response that we got to our Pick Your Own Apple offering this year that him and his 95 year old brother have decided to take the farm back and they're going to run it as a pick your own next oh. year oh big hand for that yeah. what a great story yeah. what a great story. how do you start that local food revolution where would you say the two points to there's a question up there um we did a huge amount of research. We did about three years' worth of research to understand what our options were, what it could possibly look like, because I can tell you there are so many different options. And what you guys have got going here in this community already is actually quite strong, and you've got quite a few of you in the room already. Um, <laughs> and I said it earlier, start with what you've got, where you're at, and that's your starting point. Don't create something that needs to be bigger than Ben-Hur. Start with what is achievable. Um, and make sure, to Linda's point just then, when we first started our food co-op, we had nine key people around the room and someone came because they wanted food access as an issue, someone came because they were interested in, in animal welfare, someone came because environment impact, environmental impact was critical to them, someone came because food sovereignty was critical to them. We were all there for totally different reasons and that's finding ways to sort of fit into the story. Um, I would say understand what it is that your community wants and needs and understand who can help you in that nice. environment. Great. There's an old saying in place making, stick, stop and spend. So this is to you, Linda, and maybe the others too. That question about what's the, what's the top three examples, and maybe the others could jump in here too, you have seen in rural towns to really encourage tourists to, to stop and spend. You know, what are those, if you had three quick Tips. Yeah, I've got, um, I'm not sure I can think of three on the spot right one. now, but just one that comes to mind straight away <laughs> is in Western Queensland, Kanamulla. They actually just, so they wanted to encourage people to stay overnight. So we all know that the longer people stay in a community or tourists, um, the more they will spend. So our strategy is also always around encouraging people to stop. Um, so we want them to stay overnight. So Kanamulla didn't have a lot of nighttime experiences. So they actually got some funding for um, a drive-in cinema. Um, experience. So they've just now created a nighttime experience. So now instead of the visitors coming in, stopping, having a cuppa, using the public facilities and then driving on, they're now saying, you know, through their visitor servicing, they're saying, hey, we've now had this nighttime experience, drive in cinema, um, why don't you stay? So they're going, oh, interesting, we'll stay. Um, so they're now getting people to stop and stay overnight. And once they stay overnight, you get a, a much bigger impact um, on the community. So that's 
that's one example. Also, just the one I mentioned when I on my slide, I talked about that um, little coffee shop um, at that intersection in central Queensland. That's another good strategy because it slows people down. So they've now got a reason to stop there. And what um, that gentleman does, he's actually also a drag queen. He is absolutely <laughs> phenomenal guy. That'll do Out it. in central Queensland. <laughs> well, he tells his story, you see. Right. So visitors stop. They sit down on an old milk crate and he makes them laugh and he <laughs> makes great coffee and then he tells them about the gem fields and he does not let them go out to Longreach without turning off and going into the gem fields. Beautiful, so, love it. Lots of great little stories. Yeah. Another one by someone or any other stick, stop, spin, one of those little things that you've seen or you're good? We, we offer a huge amount of uh, events and the number of times people arrive and they say, well, now that I'm here, I've just driven across from Dunkeld or, you know, we have people drive from all over the countryside to come to us. It doesn't seem to occur to them that they should stay the night after the workshop. So we often say to people, pitch tents where we are because we know then that they'll stay and actually explore what Beechworth looks like. Nice. Beautiful. Fantastic. What about some, if you had to, to call out a couple of key insights from these amazing three speakers, like we did last time with the other three speakers, what would you say? What were the takeouts you've just heard from these? I'm putting you on the spot. Who'd like to call out a couple of things around feedback? What was the real key insights and, and learnings you've just heard? Go. People on the ground are your best assets. Fantastic, thank you. A couple of others? Perseverance. Yeah, perseverance. Turn up, turn up, turn up. Good work. Keep keep at it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anything else? Yeah, I think it, everything starts. Somebody has an idea, mm -hmm. they tell somebody else, they tell their friends, they tell their neighbours, and then they tell If you think of the most powerful person in the world today, and it doesn't start with T, it starts with G, yeah. you know, this young 16 year old just yeah. started on her own. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the ripple effect is extraordinary. So, just anything else, guys? I'd say just let those ideas keep seeding. Because every little idea, every kernel that every, what I've said might not have resonated with anyone, but one small idea might have. And it's those ideas that are critical. They're seeds and they're kernels of gold. And go for it. Yeah. So wonderful. So a big hand for these extraordinary speakers. Yeah. 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 Yeah.